In recent history, I don't remember F1 being this competitive. Going into every race weekend not knowing who's going to be where. Tight margins between everyone. Four different teams capable of winning races. The sport has become exciting again. But when you think back to how one-sided 2023 was, and even the start of this season, it makes you wonder, how did F1 become exciting again, especially in such a short period of time? The first five races of 2024 were a no contest. It was looking like Red Bull would dominate another season from start to finish. Max Verstappen won the Bahrain Grand Prix by over 20 seconds, with his teammate securing a 1-2 finish for the team. It was the same story in Jeddah, with the closest non-Red Bull finisher being Charles Leclerc, who was a full 18 seconds back. After him was the McLaren of Piastri, who was a further 14 seconds behind the Monegasque. Australia was the first race for a long time that a race was actually entertaining, mainly because Verstappen was out of the equation. But had he not DNF'd, it would have been another dominant victory. Let me just say as well that Carlos Sainz's performance was genuinely insane. As someone who recently had appendicitis, I can tell you that it's hella painful. For Sainz to have surgery, then go through the recovery process and come back two weeks later and win a Grand Prix, all this man knows is... Smooth operation in Ferrari. Smooth. Where was Checo I hear you ask? He got a three-place grid penalty for impeding Nico Hülkenberg in qualifying. And then in the race, he picked up some floor damage which hindered his chances of fighting for the podium or even the win. Normal service resumed in Japan, with Carlos Sainz finishing 20 seconds behind in third. And then Lando managed to split the two Red Bulls in China, but still 13 seconds off the lead. McLaren were surprised by this podium, since Ferrari were the faster team at the time. They actually considered it a damage limitation track, so to come away with a P2 was a surprise. But I don't think anyone expected what would happen just two weeks later. Lando Norris wins for the first time in Formula One! It's victory in Miami for Norris! The Lando no wins curse was broken. Of course, with a tad bit of luck from a safety car. Plus, Max's brain just decided to go into autopilot mode for some reason. But this was the first race where Red Bull's status as Formula 1's fastest car was in question. McLaren had bought a huge raft of upgrades for this race, with Oscar only getting half and Lando getting the full package. And even with half, Piastri was rapid, taking second place early on in the race and then keeping Verstappen within touching distance thereafter. This was the turning point for them in the fight against Ferrari. Now before we move on to Imola, Monaco, Canada and the races after, there's one factor to this year's competition increase that I haven't talked about yet, and that's keeping up with the Red Bullions. The reality TV series where you get exclusive access into the personal lives of everyone in the Red Bull family. Introducing team principal Christian Horner, the man with undoubtedly the worst Riz in human history. I guarantee if you take any caveman, throw him in a time machine and transport him into today's society, he'd easily have more game than this guy. Like what even is this? Then there's Jos Verstappen. Despite being on the same team as Horner, this man is quite literally his number one op. Like even Toto is more of an ally to Christian than Jos is. During those investigations, Jos was on his knees preying on Horner's downfall. In fact, it was rumoured that the Google Drive link that was posted to the public with all those messages was sent by Verstappen Sr. himself. My man is an elite level hater. Even Kendrick wasn't this bad. I could go on and on about this civil war for another 10 minutes, but the main point is that it wasn't good for the team. Especially when Max is just trying to focus on driving the car and winning the championship, all the outside noise wasn't very helpful, and still isn't right now. Bro was even considering leaving the team at some point since Helmut was at risk of departing as well. But ultimately, they let it blow over and continued about their business. At least publicly that is. Privately, things still aren't so stable, and with the added pressure from other teams, the last thing you want is a divide from within your own camp. Things got so bad that Niwi said, you know what, I don't want any part of this, and dipped immediately. And to be honest, I don't blame him. Adrian is a simple guy. He just wants to design Formula 1 cars. All the surrounding drama wasn't appealing. Anyways, let's shift our attention back to what matters, the actual racing. That Imola weekend was a Verstappen masterclass, winning both virtually and in the real world. Lando had a great race as well though. And I know people will say, lol, he fumbled in a faster car. But in reality, he didn't. Yes, he closed in on Max during that final stint, but Max was going through his fair share of issues, saying that it felt like driving on ice. Essentially, he just couldn't get the tyres to work for some reason. And I already mentioned this in my last video, but the McLaren during the final stint is always the strongest car. As the fuel goes down and the race goes on, the McLaren enters a league of its own. They struggle in comparison to the Red Bull on higher fuel at the start of a race. My theory for this comes from a trend that I've noticed with how Red Bull approach Friday practice. Typically, when everyone is doing their long runs, Red Bull run the car with more fuel on board compared to the other teams. 
This means that when they get into the race, they're stronger during the first stint. And it's a strategy that makes sense since if they're leading, they can build up a nice gap and then they'll have a lot more options available to them. Because as soon as Lando would get close, he'd have to back off due to the dirty air from Max in front. At this point, Ferrari were demoted to being the third fastest car, but Leclerc wasn't too far off the leaders. Particularly through the low speed sections, they were mighty, an advantage that proved to be a game changer just seven days later. The second curse of 2024, broken. Charles Leclerc finally conquered the streets of Monaco. And I'm not gonna lie, this one hit me right in the feels, man. I'd been waiting for this moment forever. Crashing in 2019, not starting after taking pole in 2021, and getting screwed over by Ferrari in 2022 made that win all the more sweet. McLaren once again showed they are a force to be reckoned with, with Piastri finishing second. It was tight between those two teams, but Ferrari's pace was more due to the circuit suiting their car much better compared to everyone else. McLaren's show of form though was the most impressive in my opinion. They've typically been very strong at tracks with lots of low speed corners, but to be pretty much level with the Ferraris was the first real indication that they'd be a threat at any track. Where was Verstappen then? Well, Monaco exposed one of the biggest weaknesses of the Red Bull, which is its unwillingness to ride bumps and curbs. Especially since they usually set up the car to be a lot stiffer on the suspension, the ride quality was pretty poor according to Max, and to be honest, that's putting it mildly. Nevertheless, he could have been in the top 3 in qualifying, but a mistake on his final run cost him. Again, an uncharacteristic error from the world champion, but since the competition has become a lot stiffer since 2023, those kinds of mistakes are understandable. When you're pushing the car as hard as you can, it's a lot more common to go over the limit because you're trying too hard. Essentially, Max suffered from Leclerc syndrome trying to outpace faster cars by driving at 110% and then making mistakes in the process. The next couple of races were more Verstappen masterclasses, but I really believed Lewis was going to win in Canada, given how fast the Mercedes was that weekend. Like Canada plus Lewis Hamilton plus a fast car, that should be easy money. Up until the final runs in Q3, it was looking that way, but then he just fell off when it mattered most. Or he was sabotaged. Nah, I'm just playing. I'm not even going to get into that right now. But this race was where Mercedes joined the party up front. With a steady raft of upgrades coming in, they were starting to become serious contenders for podiums. Also, peep Ferrari, going from second fastest team to fourth fastest in a matter of four races. That's how quickly things can change in Formula 1, and it really is a testament to how unpredictable things are this season. The change in competitive order from track to track and in different conditions has just been extraordinary. This really is F1 at its peak. When the fight at the front is so close, tensions begin to rise and can eventually boil over. Game on once again. This time it's the outside line. Oh, they make contact. He's got a puncher. He's damaged his front wing. The leading contenders for the world championship come together in turn three. The crowd can't believe it. The first flashpoint of the season between the two title contenders. I don't know what you guys are going to say. Uh, excuse me. Are the title contenders in the room with us? Yeah, I get it. Max is way out in front, but I got to hype it up nonetheless. I will say though, that given the reaction to that incident, you'd think there actually was a championship battle. Lando got to experience a taste of what Max Verstappen is capable of if you dare threaten his lead. I swear, this man would rather DNF than let you overtake him. It's honestly quite funny to watch. But pretty much, this clash was two highly competitive drivers racing hard, which is what we want to see. Sometimes it ends in tears, but that's what brings life to the sport. Anyway, George came through to pick up the pieces and do this cold ass celebration, and once again, Lewis missed out on another opportunity to break that winless streak, dating back to 2021. Time after time, he'd come close, but something would always go wrong. Heading back to his home race, the chances of taking victory were slim, given the Mercedes wasn't as quick as the Red Bull or the McLaren. But you know what they say about Britain, the biggest mistake you can make is judging the weather by looking out the window. It can go from blue skies to a downpour in the blink of an eye. And as Lewis himself said, We need a repeat 2008. Who raises the stats, who takes things to stratospheric levels, and he's only got three corners now. He can see the crowd standing and giving him that round of applause. He is ready to kickstart the celebrations. Eight times we've said it before. Here's a ninth for you. Lewis Hamilton wins the British Grand Prix. And just like that, the third curse of 2024 was broken. I heard someone say, Lewis doesn't chase the records. The records are in his slipstream with DRS. 
That statement couldn't be more true. That win alone broke so many records. The most number of race victories by any driver. The most podiums. Driver with the most wins at a single circuit. First driver to win a race in 16 different seasons. And a whole lot more. But the one that was the coldest for me was the first driver to win a race after completing 300 races. Because at the start of 2023, Lewis was asked about this, with the interviewer saying that nobody had ever done it. And his response? But there has never been a driver like me. That's what I'm talking about! Actually, goat Mercedes competitive that race was really down to the weather conditions. The W15 at the time generally just preferred cooler conditions. This marked the sixth different winner in 12 races in 2024. Just two drivers in the top four teams hadn't won yet. Those two being Sergio Perez and Oscar Piastri. The Australian driver advances all the way to the checkered flag. Oscar Piastri wins for the first time in Formula One. And then there were seven. This one was coming for a while. Oscar managed his race superbly, taking the lead into turn one, managing his pace perfectly. Had he been stopped before Lando during the second round of pit stops, we wouldn't have had that whole team orders kerfuffle. It took away the joy from Piastri's first win a little bit, which is a bit sad, but I'm 100% certain he's got many more ahead of him. He had blistering pace in Belgium as well, but this was a race where track position proved to be key. As the man himself said, clean air is king. Following other cars is becoming as big as a problem as the previous generation, if not even worse. But what I'm happy about is that the margins between all the cars are incredibly close now, and quite literally anyone can win from anywhere. Russell's call to do the one stop was a race winning decision, and we've seen him make those kind of ballsy decisions in the past. High risk, high reward. It flipped the entire race on its head and gave us a thrilling finish. Now unfortunately he was disqualified at the end and so Lewis ended up taking the win, but Lewis did also deserve it. He drove a brilliant race from start to finish. It's just that George and Mercedes caught him by surprise with the one stop strategy working better than expected. I'll be talking more about the Belgian Grand Prix in my next video, so stay tuned for that. But to conclude this one, 2024 has quickly become one of the best seasons I've ever watched. And if there's anything we've learned going forward, it's to expect the unexpected. I hope you all enjoyed. Please like, share, and subscribe to the channel if you're new to keep up to date with all my future videos. And as always, I'll see you in the next one.